the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hello, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are playwright, actor Vince Malaki and artist Edith Bauman. Playwright, actor Vince Malaki was born and raised in Pennsylvania. He graduated from Penn State with a degree in theater and playwriting. He's done lots of theater, acted in films uh, like Austin Powers, King of the Road, and you've seen him in TV shows like ER, NYPD Blue, Monk, Judging Amy, and all of those are acting, so wait till we hear about his playwriting. Vince has written several plays, one of which, Lions, which we have the I guess we have, what is the manuscript on the set, <laughs> was a nominee for the 2009 Ovation Award. And you obviously, Vince, wanted to be a playwright because that's what you graduated in. Right. How right. does one decide he wants to be a playwright? Uh, honestly, it, it was by default. Oh. I, uh, <laughs> no, no. I, when I, uh, you know, I, I grew up in, in Pittsburgh and uh, I, was, I was working as a janitor and I didn't have any direction in my life, so I figured I would go to college, find out what I wanted to do. And I saw Al Pacino acting, and so I thought, you know what? That looks like fun. I'll do that. No. I, I swear to God. And, um, and so I, I took some community uh, uh, college oh, courses. Oh, that's what you did? And I had to take, I mean, my, my, my work in high school was, was so poor that I had to take remedial courses to get my grades up. And oh. so the only thing that was open was Principles of Playwriting, taught by um, Roger Cornish. And um, the first day of the class, Cornish comes in and he says, um, listen, by the end of this trimester, I want everyone in this class to have a one-act play written. I don't care what it is. I want a one-act play and I want a title on it or else you will fail. Oh, yeah, and so you've never even done anything. You'd ne I'd you never written, written anything, no, right. nothing, right. you know, my name on a piece of paper, that's about it. Right. And um, so, <laughs> I, uh, so I called my dad in a panic and, uh, because my, my father, he was a pizza man, but, but he liked to write and, you know, uh, it was never published. But Did he actually make pizza? Yeah. yeah he did? Yeah, yeah. In fact, the, the pizza shop um, that he started and owned is now still running. My brother owns it. Um, You're kidding. Yeah. In Pittsburgh? Yeah, in, uh -oh. in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. Oh, in McKeesport. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's where Andy Warhol's from. Yes, exactly. His whole family's from in McKeesport. Fact, in fact, they, you got him. They so. used to come and have pizza up there, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> no, did they? No, but he used to drink up at Bonovich. This is what they told me, because I was a little younger than yeah. that. Yeah. But he used to drink up at Bonovich's, and I don't know if it's true or not, but he used to make doodles on, on pieces of paper, and he would give them to old man Bonovich. <laughs> <laughs> and old man Bunovich, you know, had all these doodles and, you know. Oh, that's great because his family lived there. I know. On Steel Street, apparently. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, so he made, you called your dad who was so a called, pizza maker. Right. Yeah. But, you know, he wanted to be an author. And, and Oh, he did. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was one of those deals right. where, you know, he, you know, he, he supported his family and, and he did what he needed to do. And so those sort of distractions that's the way they were looked at in, in a blue collar world. Those sort of distractions, just he just didn't really go after them. And so, um, so I called him up and I said, Dad, Dad, what do I do? And he said to me, he said, well, what do you know about King Henry V? I said, I don't know. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> and he, he said, uh, well, you can't write about him. Oh. What do you know about him? And I said, Oh, that janitor. was smart, wasn't it? Yeah. That was smart because you write what you know about, and that's, what, that's what he was telling you. That's what I and that's what I do. Wasn't that great? So you wrote about being a janitor. Yeah, I wrote about I wrote about these four janitors um, in McKeesport, and one of them wants to break free from his existence there, and um, I wrote it. And at the end of the term, Mr. Cornish came over and he said to me, he "said Malaki, I want you to take this over the summer." 
work on it because next year we're going to produce this <gasps> in the new playwright series. You're kidding. Yeah, so was, that was it, not by default, by talent. <laughs> well, I got about. lucky. I got lucky. But but the other thing is, so you wrote a lot. You wrote Last Snow, Cow, uh, Bully, and especially Lions that Lions, we were talking about. Yeah. But were those all things you knew about? Pretty much. You know, I stick with, you know, there are certain themes that I stick with. I stick with the working class. Uh -huh. Always a working class. Because uh -huh. um, that's what I know. That's where I come from. I stick with... Um, I usually stick with the Midwest or Western Pennsylvania because oh, oh, yeah. that's what I know. Um, and uh, I, you know, there's a lot of religion in my plays. Um, there's a, there's a whole Catholicism under underlying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because that was Andy and his whole family Catholic, yeah. very Catholic. I didn't even know that. So. Oh yeah, very Catholic. Hmm. Yeah, I used to work for him, so I know all those things. <laughs> so been, here we are together. Have you been to the museum? I was yes, I was oh, there, okay. and I was in Pittsburgh for the funeral. Oh wow! I went to the uh, that beautiful little church that was uh, not Serbian, but uh, Croatian. Croatian, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was fabulous. <laughs> well, when you started writing, <laughs> here we are. You never yeah. knew it, did no, you? Yeah, yeah, no. When you started writing, did you think you'd be writing for yourself to act in? Because you were acting. No, and I don't, I, 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 I act, but I don't act in my own plays. Oh, you don't? No, and I'll tell you why. I, I, I wrote a play called Figures that was done 10 years ago at Pacific Resident Theater in our co-op space. That was my first full length that was, that was done there. And I was going to act in it. And I said to, uh, there's a writer who, again, he's an uh, alumni of, of Pacific Resident Theater, Oliver Goldstick. And... Uh, his play Wild Boy was just done there last year. I said to him, I said, I was, in fact, I was acting on a pilot of his. He, he had written a pilot and I was, I was oh, an you actor were, oh, on, he it, brought on the you show. Oh, you in as an actor. Yeah, and so I, we, I remember we were on the trolley going to set from base camp. And I said, you know, Oliver, I said, I, I have this play that I wrote and I'm thinking about acting in it. Do you think I should act in it? And he goes, well, do you have to? Um. And I said, not really. And he goes, then I wouldn't. He said, I've never learned more than I have sitting in the last row of the theater watching the audience when they're watching my play. Oh. That's where you learn. That's where you learn how to write. So if you're acting, you can't see that. Right. Yeah. And so that's why early on when we were doing lines, we did it at co-op, I, I was frustrated as an actor in, in the play because I filled in for a small role. And oh, you just did. Just thinking, yeah. okay, it wouldn't be a big deal. Right. But... Um, you know, it, it ended up being more than I. I so you I were you could never be in the audience when you were in a small role, even if you were in a small role, right? Because the way the set was was constructed, yeah. it was it was one of those deals where it, I could have it would have just been too difficult. And then the play became so popular that it was sold out well, there for was most no, of the run. There were no seats, no room. You know. What was it about? Uh, Lions. It was about uh, it was about the. Um, Unemployment picture in Detroit um, oh. in 2007, and using the Detroit Lions football season. Oh, that's what Lions as was. As a backdrop, what, oh, basically yeah. it follows the main character John Waite, and what 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 John does is he he worked in a metal factory that he got laid off from, and he finds that, you know, he ends up losing his his job, his wife, everything, because he loses his hope. And his hope lies within the lions. His hope, he loses his hope. That's what everybody's talking about even today, that if you're upbeat and you, ha and you have hope and you go out and you don't let it get you down, you're going to be okay right. somehow. But he regains it. I mean, he comes, he comes to the realization because there's a point in there where he goes to the placement center and he says, uh, he says to the woman, you know, I'm looking for work. Right. And, and, she, and she says, well, we have these service jobs. And he feels that service jobs are above him. He's worked in this place all his life. It's what he knows. And finally, um, he uh, ends up taking the service job. So it's very poignant. And it's also, you, you wrote it in 2007. It could have been, been written for 2010, 2011, 2009. Yeah. Same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, obviously, it touched a lot of people, especially the critics, because... You did. You were nominated, or you won. I I was nominated for uh, nominated. best playwriting for yeah. an Ovation Award. Fantastic. What about 
Julia now. That's at the Pacific Resident Theater, which is on Venice Boulevard? 705 Venice. In oh, Venice. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's great. It has yeah. two or three different little theaters we have there. Three, we have three theaters there. We have uh, a, a large space at the end, which is pretty big. Then we have the middle space, which is my favorite space, which is what, what I'm in, which is also a main stage space, but it's my favorite <coughs> space. And then we have a small space, which is the co-op workshop space. Oh, the workshops. You've been there over 16 years. Yeah, yeah I've been so there a long time. It is, would you call yourself a part of the ensemble, or does that change? What happens with that? It's in flux. People come, people go. I see, um, I I've, I've been there forever and a day, and, and uh, thank God. I mean, it's a great... It's a great place to be. Have you done, do you do lighting? Do you do that kind of no, thing? No. no. I mean, I've just wondered if you're working yeah. all together doing no, that type of thing. I'm, I'm lucky in that, you know, as far as my writing, I mean, I act, but, but my writing, which is really what I focus on there now, I'm lucky that I have a group of people around me that are really good. Like, f the same people from Lions are working on Julia for the oh, most part. Tell us about Julia, the story. Uh, the, the story started, actually, um, when I, I visited my grandmother and she had dementia. And, um, and so I, I, you know, I was, I was kind of like put off by it, you know, just a little unnerved by it. And it sort of stuck in my head that, you know, what happens to people when, you know, they, they, they get into they Alzheimer's. Feel? Yeah. I yeah. wonder how they feel. How do they feel? And, and. We know how we react, but I wonder right. how they feel. Well, yeah. And, and, and also, you know, they're a person. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, a lot of times people will look at Alzheimer's patients or, or people with dementia, and they'll, they'll go, yeah, they got dementia. Right. They've had a life. I know. They've had an impact on somebody. And uh, So that's what the, the story, that's what you've written. How did you cast something like that? Because she's an older woman, obviously. It was great. I, uh, Isn't it we true? Have, we, have, uh, we have a woman named Roses Pritchard uh, doing the lead role of Julia. And what's, what was terrific about it was I, was, I, I also do voiceover work. And I was at my voiceover agents. And um, she came out and introduced me to a couple guys. And, and the one guy, she said to him, Vince wrote this play called Lions and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, what are you working on now? And I said, well, I'm working on this play called Julie. I'm casting it, and I'm oh, having a hard it. time. Uh -huh. But this is the good part: is is he said, well, um, I have a buddy of mine because we were looking to cast the older role, the, actually lead right. Lou. And um, he said, my buddy would be perfect for that role. Oh, so that was the male role too, my, male lead. Well, the, I was looking for the male lead and the female lead. I see. Yeah. And so, so I said, well, let me send you the stuff. And so I sent the stuff over to him. And the guy calls up, uh, my buddy, David Nathan Schwartz, is doing a casting on it. He called him up and he said, yeah, I'd like to come in and read. And, and he said, okay, that's fine. He said, but I also noticed that you're casting the role of Julia. Um, could my wife come in for that? And, no. and Schwartz goes, yeah, sure. And so she comes in and we saw like probably like 15 actresses that night. And they were, they were all great. But the minute she walked in that room, Five, five of us who were sitting there in a casting Except session. Like that. It was it. You just knew it. it Isn't it. that great? You it know it. it. Yeah. Yeah. But how old are they? How old are... Uh, uh, the actors. The, well, uh, the role of Julia is 72. Mm -hmm. The role of Lou, the male lead, which is played by Richard Fancy, um, he's, 70, he's supposed Older. to be 72. He's, he's younger. He's, he's, oh, he's younger. Yeah, we found that, you know, like w with, a, with a big role like this, it's sort of like with Lear, you know, you have to have a younger guy playing the older guy. But he's, he's younger in real life. Oh, but yeah. The, but the role is the older role. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's a I Korean see. War vet. I see, I see, I see. And so they're acting with each other? Yes, it's, it's, it's pretty much basically this. It's... This guy comes back to his hometown after being gone for 53 years to see the G.C. Murphy's torn down. Uh. And he accidentally finds out that uh, the guy who runs the coffee shop across the street, which is really a front for a bookie joint, um, is the son of the, his first true love oh, I see. named Julia. I got it. And um, he left on a really bad note. 
and he has this sin he needs to atone for. That's where your religion comes in. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and your worker and your everything. It's very Tracy Letts in Chicago. Yeah. Same, same type of thing. We have to go. Okay. But I want to thank you so much. Okay. And I know, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Okay. Thank Great. you. Thanks a lot. And we'll be right back with Edith Bauman. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with artist Edith Bauman, who grew up in Arlington, Virginia. She has a BA from UCLA and an MFA from USC. Her work has been exhibited in galleries from San Francisco to Germany. Uh, did painting start for you before you went to UCLA? No. How did you get started? Um, <laughs> I was math science. Oh, math science. But it all kind of comes into yeah, to I know. play now. So, yeah, so when you, you know, so like in high school I took um, uh, physics and calculus and things like that. And um, I, it was just subtle, uh, parents well-educated that, uh, you know, you paint on weekends or something, you know, it was, that was just You have a, to be a math teacher uh, or a physics. Well, and, well and, and, you know, how many people earn their living being an artist? That's what I know, mean. That, you had to do something professional, right? Right, right. Um, well, yeah, when you so. got to UCLA, were you taking art classes? No, I, oh, was, a, I was a biology major and so forth. Oh. But then I did, actually, just the last um, three quarters, <laughs> I, took, I took art classes. And I usually, uh, uh, um, the first two quarters I got into the class, um, like the quarters are 10 weeks long and I'd get in the eighth, eighth week, <laughs> you know, because I'd have to wait for people to drop out because I was a science major. Before you could get in. Yeah, were the I teachers in, good? Who were the teachers there? Jim Doolin All was, right. I, I learned so much from him because I went in, I, ha I didn't take beginning painting, I took advanced painting. <laughs> you and skipped over beginning. I skipped over and, you know, and then, and then I did all the assignments and homework assignments and stuff at home for eight weeks. Oh, oh for to, to, to catch to, up? So that I would, you know, be in line so that when somebody would right, drop out that right. I would be able to get in. And I remember my first painting class because, you know, I had all the list of the stuff you know, the paint Material. and the turp, yeah, turp, <laughs> and you know, but I'd never done it. I was going to so, ask you what you used on your canvas, but, for, but well, why didn't you stay? Acrylic. Why didn't you stay at UCLA? Why'd you go to SC for your Master in Fine Arts? There was 10 years in between. Oh, there was. There was 10 years in between, and I had started teaching some on the university level. And Math? Uh, no, oh. art. Oh, you were teaching art after before I you got, got an your... art degree, right? No, with an art degree from UCLA. Oh, just, it was. Yeah, just undergraduate, and I started teaching, you know, part time, and I knew I would make more money doing the same thing if I had an MFA. So it was like ten years. So later you went to SC. I... Were there teachers there that you wanted to have? Or? No, I ended up there because it was free. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> they gave me a grant. To because go for yeah. a three-year program, and uh, you know, so I thought, gee, I could get my MFA and um, get my degree at the same time. <laughs> and they can be proud of you because you've done really well. And tell <laughs> how did you get into this type of work, and what do you call it? What do I call it? I, I always have kind of a hard time. I, um, you know, like the the last maybe five years, I started calling it jazz series and that was really because I always said untitled before oh, that. Before it was, a, but you never called it pattern painting? Uh, no, I never called it pattern. Or and, minimal? Uh, no, because I never considered it minimal because I, I didn't I didn't like par down you know to like the essence or... You but know, when so, you started a canvas what did you put on it? Um, I, I would um, I don't, there was this long progression of, of thinking about abstract, I mean what got me started with abstract art was really when I was at UCLA and because I was kind of a beginning painter but at the end of, you know, I was getting my degree quickly, 
that um, there was an Edo uh, period Japanese oh. screen show that was there. And, you know, so there would be like black fish going across an undulating surface of gold or, you know, some things like that. Yes, and but it was, you never think was, of that as being pattern, do you? No. And that is in it, a way. It's a pattern and there's movement. That's and interesting. It, and there's a number of two color things. Yes. And, and then I was also, you know, taking art history classes and stuff and, and, and I was getting the notion of, of one black painting is amazing, one black square, and another black square is, you might as well throw it in the trash. How could that be? Yeah, why? Why? Tell us why. Why well, is it, it? you know, so, I mean, that's what started intriguing yes, me. Yes, but it's me true, in. because most um, one-color painters, color field painters, right. say, it's not really gray. There's 30 colors underneath yeah, it. Yeah, right. Well, and that's what comes <laughs> into play, those kind of things. And then, and then whether there's a transparency of layering the color yeah. and the touch of the, the brush or the hand or um, how you do the edges and is there any space or is there not? And I don't know, all those or things how with do you the brush place work. It? And, how do you yeah. place it? One, so, one of the things that I know you said that every brush mark may, means something to you on your canvas. Well, I, I, mean, I, I mean, like you said, did I ever call them pattern or whatever, but I was always into the repetition of the same mark. So whether oh, it was oh. a mark of like graphite or a mark of the brush stroke or um, you know, just some sort of repetition. So that's how I got into this repetition of the bars. These are the bars. These right. were when in the 80s? Yeah, those are in the 80s, like the mid 80s. And, and, and what and, are and they, two For colors? whatever reason, it didn't, yeah. Two well, colors, but they're, or are they one color? Well, <laughs> they're, they're two colors, but like that's not a white and whatever that is, green or gray or, you know, it's and what is this? This isn't a gray and a black. No, I mean, because there's like 10 different layers of thin coats of different colors. And, and then plus it's all done. I never use tape, so it's all done with a small brush and many, many layers. And the, the buildup of the bars is always different than the, the color of the buildup of the surround color. So I would go back and forth, back and forth, ah. back and forth, till I thought I got it close to the same plane, you know, I just wanted it to them to sort of hover. I but didn't you don't want tape deep them off. Space. Then no. how do you make a straight line for the bars? Well, I, I drew them you drew a with line. a graphite, I see. but then, you know, after 10 layers, I mean, I'm just going along. Oh, like that. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> so this, it, uh, it's a meditative process. This one, so too. That, that one, too. There, there's red under there, there's green under there, there's black under the blue. That's what we and talk about, yeah. And, you know, and what I always felt, too, was that, that because these are he were heavily structured, that the, the transparent layers made them breathe. To me, so they're it, moving to you. So, yeah, they're th well, there's a breath to them. There's a... What, 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 one of the things is, how do you choose the colors? Um, it's totally um, just intuitive. I might, like this one, I might have thought I was going to do a red and white painting. Is that right? And then I, so I put on the red maybe on the bars and then the white oh. around the outside and then I go, hmm, the red needs to be darker. The white is, I, that's not working right. It's too much space. So I, I go back and forth, back and forth, and I've always done that. I've, and it turns out to be blue and black, maybe. Right. Or whatever Just because color. I get it darker, I get it bluer, you know, like the red needs to be bluer, and then suddenly it's like, well, I think I should change this, and, and I'm just moving back and forth. Th those are like really strong colors. The one show that I saw at the uh, Broad Stage, what's the name of that gallery? Right, the um, uh, Barrett Gallery. The Barrett Gallery. Those were very pastel-y to me. Well, some of them were. So, but you what? Know, what but are there the was like a red and black. Happen? Those were happening at the same time. Where I'd do a, like it would end up being a white on, on white painting, except maybe the white had been over blue and black oh, and, so they and built start, up. So it wasn't pastel in your mind when you went to it. Not necessarily. I see. So sometimes, you, sometimes how, it works out that way. How do you? You mean they just come? 
you don't choose the colors because I was going to ask you how do you choose the color I combinations? Don't, I don't choose. I, I I start out thinking that I've chosen the color okay. combination, <laughs> and then sometimes if it, I want it to be really light, like a yellow and white, and then it's just not. It's it's the yellow's too green or the white's too pink or I don't know, and it's not you know, and it becomes something else. Then I still have in my head I want to do that yellow and white painting. So then. In that process, I might have figured out something, but then there was too much paint on there. So then I might be able to do a yellow and white painting on another painting and get there how sooner. Many, how many canvases do you work on at the same time? It varies. Where I, it, Usually at least two. But and, sometimes and are they can, just canvas with acrylic or canvas with oil? Or? These have all been acrylic. And that, that I ended up with acrylic basically having to learn to paint again because... Um, I had medical problems with the uh, oil oh, and did you? hydrocarbons and oh, yeah. paint thinner turpentine and stuff. But I grind my own pigments because oh. Oh, a so lot the of the acrylics don't have a lot of pigment. I so see. I get a lot stronger color than most people that use I see. acrylic. And they bounce and off why, of each other. And that's why people also think these are oils. Yeah. Usually it, that's... Would you call it a landscape? Would you call it a portrait? <laughs> these jazz series? You know, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I called them jazz series because I started trying to, I wanted to help the viewer to, to get into them more. Because they looked and, like they were notes to me. And, and well, like. so they started out, it was jazz series, and then I yeah. changed it to jazz notes. Oh, jazz notes. You know, yeah. like more just trying to help the viewer to right. like, Right. get into it. So then there's a little bit more space, there's more movement. These all have centers. Oh, they do. So they all oh, yes, basically they came from, in my mind, earlier mandala paintings that I did. Oh, I see. So they start they, in and move out. And they move out. I see. Um, do you listen to music while you're playing, while uh, you're painting? Sometimes. Uh huh. But not the kind of like jazz music? Some, I mean, I've always, for 40 years, I'm a jazz fan. That's sort oh, of that's my right. favorite. But I mean, you know, like now I might I might listen to opera. I mean, you know, it's not necessarily painters always paint the same thing, or a lot of painters paint the same thing, and people expect or, you to have uh, one style. But um, your style is very risky because you never know what's going to happen. So you're taking risks every time you go to your canvas. Well, I find it exciting that way, and I guess that's why too I do maybe the light on light and then the high contrast ones because it's fun to, I don't know, to push yourself where you, you know, like, okay, I, f I figured out that one and now let's do something else that just pushes the envelope a little bit. Well, uh, you have to sit there and look at them and I absolutely adore looking at your paintings. They do thank move you. and they do speak and they do sing. And I thank you so much for coming today. Well, thank you. Thanks, Edie. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profile, 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. But email at J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 -N at AOL.com. Bye. <laughs>